my name's Adam Blaney. I'm a lecturer at, Lan uh, at Lancaster. So um, I think I've just been trying to sort of reflect on what was generated over the PhD and current research and what that sort of means in terms of using research through design as a, an approach to interacting with nonlinear materials and what that sort of means. So, is it, oh, there we go, sorry. So in terms of our research through design and why it can be useful. So it can be very explorative as an approach. And that means it can be highly flexible but guided by a loose aim. And that's really useful in this sense of this sort of developing design and fabrication processes with, with nonlinear materials because they obviously throw out really unexpected results. And having a set research question, maybe I'm trying to think of this in, in a PhD setting as well, it could maybe throw that predefined question out the window. So whereas having a flexible approach that's open to sort of all these unexpected results, you can take a lot of learnings from them and just sort of generate quite, it, it, you can use it iteratively and you can take quite higher level principles out of it, which do generate these kind of theories and new approaches for design and fabrication with nonlinear materials that seem to, from what I'll show as well, like a series of prototypes that, do that can be applied across a range of material platforms as well. So they, they can be really robust in that sense as well. Um, so yeah, I just want to also highlight what a series of prototypes I've been through and the main sort of um, the main taking away from them as well. And like how they were iterative and how I could use them to be built on them. So oh, it's I think my computer is really slow. Sorry about this. So in terms of the framing of what it was that I wanted to explore from the PhD and, and ongoing research was biology is amazing at creating um, adaptive structures at really high resolutions that have multiple adaptive properties and they can self-heal and everything we're doing in an artificial design and fabrication process isn't able to do that because there's no discourse between the design parameters, the material properties and the fluctuating design demands. So it's like, how do we create a discourse between all this as a way to create new design and fabrication processes? Sorry, just jumped ahead. Um, so really coming from an architectural design background, the main issue I had with that starting off and what collaborations have leading towards is I need to select material platforms that would enable these discourses. So basically what that means is selecting material platforms that are susceptible to stimuli and when you modulate stimuli you can program materials at high resolutions and this is just sort of giving an overview of the different material platforms that I've used to be able to really test and build on this approach which is term tunable environment so first um, a series of pro prototypes used the mineral accretion approach then I used um paints and inks to sort of see what the role of scaffolds were in there. So that was interaction with diffusion. And then current research is using state changing materials and magnetism to sort of attract and, and, and move material around where I need to. And it's all based on this idea of modulating stimuli to constantly tune and update material properties based on design updates. So just to walk through so like really basic initial experiments was a key finding that came from it that was that sort of felt like a really sort of failure. I think what I'll say a lot of this through that, this is like a lot of experiments initially feel like failures. Um, and in a, in a sort of a student or a PhD student context, this could sort of maybe throw you for a wobble. But actually when you just sit and reflect on them, you take off this higher level principle. So this initial one, experiment was basically highlighted the need for turbulence in these nonlinear material systems and this idea of turbulence to offset overriding conditions. So what happened here was as gravity basically made all these molecules in the middle of creation settle towards the bottom. 
and that meant all the material accumulated on the base of this, uh, this cathode scaffold. Oh, don't know why, sorry, it's just jumped ahead. Um, so you need to introduce agitation, this idea of turbulence to suspend the material so you could actually, it grows more robustly by introducing turbulence. You get some robustness out of the system as well, but also um, continued growth. A second sort of iteration on that was, okay, so I've introduced turbulence. I've got some, It's this material's grown homogeneously, as you can see on the second cathode, but there was this issue of contamination in there and the proliferation of this condition. So when you get to threshold conditions in a solution or a, on an environment, you can get some, these conditions can proliferate and contaminate structures as well. And that may or may not be desirable. But this is need for introducing redundancy into the system when these things sort of occur as well. And then sort of moving on towards this was this, um, another one was like, okay, I'm going to try and address this issue of um, contamination. So I replaced a, uh, an anode that could be dissolved in the mineral accretion process with a, uh, with a carbon one. But then also the way of what you analyze or how you document your uh, material results is can also throw up these new insights as well. So this was based on some um, scanning uh, electron microscope analysis where um, a small section of a cathode is put under an electron microscope and it highlighted this um, issue of purity, but also localized stimuli. So you could change, if you could somehow get localized stimuli induced, you can um, generate, sorry, you can get, you could tune and adapt materials with more accuracy or with more fidelity as well. So then that led on to the idea of separating cathode scaffolds out within a mineral accretion process to induce and modulate localized stimuli. And what that lets you then do is grow very low resolution sort of global patterns that can um, have the local tune, properties tuned and adapted so I could tune the volume of material and the type of material by, by changing the electrical current within the system as well. And that also occurs within three, so this is just a video showing like the mineral accretion process starting, it can induce it on one sort of area and you can do it within three dimensions. And then over time, you can then induce it in a second location as well. So it, it sort of isn't constrained to this 2D, um, this 2D sort of um, application. You can then expand it to 3D. So it's, it's, it's robust over sort of volume as well. So that's a potential advantage over 3D printing technologies, which are layer, layer by layer based. So those are all analog um, approaches to like um, trying to program matter. So then I wanted to incorporate digital design tools into it. And then that required creating associations between digital parameters, material properties, and the stimuli parameters as well. So this was based on associated modeling where I'd set a what like set volumes or predict growth times based on previous results to grow desired volumes of materials. So then, yeah, you can grow materials. Like it, it, it sort of established that you can upload digital information into materials. So this sort of was the big jump of what Phil has also established in persistent modeling. You can use stimuli to maintain a discourse with material properties. But because the mineral accretion process is based on assembly of like sort of molecules, you can keep updating and changing the shape and prop and multiple properties of a sort of a volume of material. But also it's not even you then this nonlinear material properties come into it even more where the volume's not even just constrained to this cathode scaffold shape. You get these branching structures that are highly emergent out of it that are totally beyond my, the control of this. So then you actually get multiple material properties coming in. So it gives, it then opens up a really big search a challenge that I'll talk about a bit more later on in the, in the summary of it all. So as I say, you get you can get translucency, you get sort of different opacities, you get different sort of um, like complex shapes within it all, it, just from very sort of a simple stimuli. 
that open up new sort of applications. So that was all based on sort of cause and effect relationships and there's no feedback between the stimuli and material properties generated. So it's, it's obviously impossible in them setups to determine if anything desirable has been produced. So this final iteration using the mineral accretion process tried to incorporate um, sensors external to the materials to understand when materials have been grown and, and if they're desirable. And what that basically means is you create these sort of associations between this system logics, between the stimuli, the properties, maintaining threshold conditions. So, so properties that are being measured can be done a bit more or reliably, but it basically means the whole design and fabrication process is based on these really in these interrelationships that that do affect one another, like they are based on these cause and effect. So a real issue again, it felt like a massive failure that uh, no material was grown for some reason within sort of three iterations of this um, this sort of experiment, and then it's sort of then reviewing that. From a higher level again so to looking at the sensor readings that are incorporated externally there's no sort of coherent trend between them all so you start getting it down on yourself and this was like getting towards the real end of the phd going oh right so what's actually going on here and like is there any sort of value in this and it sort of then highlights that I was trying to use associated modeling, which basically means cause and effect relationships like parametric modeling on nonlinear materials, which just don't map on. They just, there's, there's just real, they just, they just don't face up to each other. So um, when you incorporate, so the main takeaway is, is incorporating sensors that are external to these material types is, they can emit signals, but what that means is you get non-linear associations from them. So you can't use associated modeling tools for that. You'd need to use tools that are based on non-linear mappings. And I don't want to get into the technical details of it, but it's sort of in order to get desirable or robust sort of interactions with these materials, like moving them further, if you were to sort of wanted to go up in the technology readiness levels to get them sort of more desirable or like guiding them with more robustness is the sort of you need more robust design tools to be able to interact with them and those are based on linear research linear relationships so main aspect or if i just go back the issue with this stuff was is the global shapes are based on these predefined scaffolds so i was wondering what is the role of scaffolds in these in these materials and how can you get flexible scaffolds to begin to sort of um, provide more, well, yeah, more flexibility in the system? Sounds very really st stupid. So then there's this idea of using contrasting scaffolds um, where silicone is incorporated with liquid based paints, uh, sorry, water based paints, and they can be used to sort of displace material as well maintain softer boundaries that can also still be sort of moved around and manipulated and you get very different kind of um, sort of edges to these things as well you can get kind of gradient materials in this you can get void spaces that are maintained so these are really like very loose kind of explorations but informed by what what scaffolds or what role scaffolds could play in this and again it's all like it's iterative it was based on like um, this idea of just making with RTD or research through design to explore this. So another aspect it was that that was based in 2D. I was interested in well, what happens if you mix contrasting liquids together. So oil on the top and water on the bottom. And that creates this kind of interface between materials that you get 2D patterns and then 3D patterns all at the same time. And then you get spontaneous interactions as well. Like I've not deliberately introduced any stimulus into this. They just create their own sort of interactions at this point as well. Um, so I think that's interesting and well of how you can make, you can have different interactions with different scaffolds as well. So then again, yeah. Carrying on with sort of 3D scaffolds, this was comparing diffusion in um, 
a different sort of scaffold properties where stimuli could be dampened, where syrup sort of slowed down interactions as well and made them, you could still get rapidly generated properties, but you can slow them down even when they're sort of still highly complex. And again, oh, sorry. You can, you can even suspend these material interactions you're spending on the scaffold. So you could start to imagine, I think another real strong aspect of research shoe design is you can then start taking these principles and speculating on what that could mean for new sort of, or current technologies where in my mind, you could take these things for 3D printing, where you could rapidly generate things in 3D using those ink diffusion patterns change the properties of scaffold to freeze them in time and create very delicate structures that are that are very complex to generate computationally in, in a digital environment. Um, but you can you can get these things free or very rapidly under their own logics in in material computation. Um, and then just wanted to go through some current research and kind of give a reflection on what or how it sort of feels and maybe now interacting or shifting away from certain things. So I've tried, I'm working on a multi-stimuli system where you can basically, like with heat and magnetism to change the state of materials with the aim of uploading information into materials and freezing that information into the structure as well. So basically the issue with all the past one was these are create, these are all occurring with um, these are all occurring within liquid environments, so you can't take them out. So by using state changing materials and a multi-stimuli system is you'll be able to take these updatable materials out of the tank, interact with them, sort of say that's a bit redundant, put it back in this tank and, and re-update them. So this is sort of where it's showing this system working, where there's a first iteration, it can re gets melted down, you then put it back in, you use the magnets to change this sort of magnetized wax to update the design of it. It's then seeing what other sort of introducing water into the system to see what that sort of has effects on it. But it sort of lends itself to this idea of circular materials and how you can keep updating materials instead of them being becoming redundant, you can change them and update them. And then that could have implications within the circular economy as well. So it's not just, we have a design, it's been broken, it can self heal itself, we can update it and it can have new applications as well. And again, they have these, so it has these different qualities as well. It have these multi-material qualities. It's got different transparencies. It's got different gradients. It's got different global patterns as well, but are less constrained. And this is again, looking at fabric, um, sort of co combining these waxes with um, fabric where you can get different porosities, um, different global patterns, and then these these have, you could use these for the, sorry, it'll skip on where you can have different applications or you could sort of then, the real challenge is attributing what is a desirable property when you are updating them as well. Like how do you sort of create association between an application and what, how you're programming these materials? Um, I think, sorry. Oh, no. Yeah, so I just want to sort of begin to summarise on how annotated portfolios help this approach within research to design. So it, they, they do play a role in sort of creating a theory as well, where you'll use annotated portfolios um, to document the key sort of decisions in each iteration you go through. So I've gone through, I've tried to give an overview of that as well in each sort of prototype I've gone through where it moves from sort of turbulence to issues of contamination to how you can induce localized stimuli to the role of scaffolds and feedback and what it means to sort of be able to like freeze updates into materials as well. And they're really sort of, in a, in a sort of a thesis context, I found they were kind of key in sort of describing this iterative journey and actually where sort of the knowledge and the theory points are really generated as well. 
so it's about yeah it's all in summary it's about sort of generating this sort of in um into relationships between digital design fabrication mechanisms and material platforms through stimuli and modulating that and creating these associations between between all these components in these design and fabrication systems so material and structures can be updated um, and that seems like a really at the moment a robust approach to be able to sort of go into to update materials where it's sort of been demonstrated across material mineral accretion process ink diffusion and um, sort of state changing materials but just to sort of conclude on these things it is i think it opens up the bigger question of what is a desirable adaptation when you're sort of beginning to create structures that can be adapted um especially within more complex situations as well like what would it mean what in a sort of a a city context if if your urban environment was all adaptive and responsive and there's multiple stakeholders how do you constitute or how do you determine what are desirable adaptations um i think that's a really sort of interesting area to explore and again i think you could explore it through sort of like again research your design aspects and sort of how you're measuring these things um i think sort of as well and uh, taking it sort of a bit of a reflection now and put this together was i feel as if i'm moving from kind of not very open um non-linear systems to maybe more well less sort of open ones ones that aren't as noisy when you sort of with the sort of the wax kind of um investigations because they feel as if they are more cause and effect um cause and effect kind of materials as well so it's quite interesting to sort of go you can still upload and tune stim like tune material properties with stimuli but depending on the material prop founds they can they can have less open results as well and i think moving into an academic position it's sort of then seeing where the values added with this approach are these kind of materials where with the non with the sort of more robust things with the sort of state change in wax it's like you can apply those you can apply those um abilities to a kind of a defined problem area but then i think you sort of by giving them defined responses as well do you also lose something in their flexibility and adaptability where it's sort of you're constraining their abilities as well which is quite an interesting tension and then does that detract away from what could be seen as desirable sort of adaptions as well so i'd just like to finish there and say thank you very much as well for having me um hi everyone so um i'm adrian and wait i think something is yeah and um so as dylan was saying i'm a phd candidate in uh, cita the center for it and architecture that is at the royal danish academy in copenhagen and um, so my research sits in the fungal architectures age 2020 research uh, project and i will be presenting some reflections on sustainability aesthetics and simulation um, that articulate around uh, cross person um, cross personship and cultivated uh, and cultivated composites so before proceeding i would just like to decipher the the title of this intervention uh, you may have encountered the term cosmotechnics previously. It was proposed by the contemporary philosopher Yukui, and he defines it as the merging of the cosmic and moral order around technical activities, which means basically that it represents a situated, coherent technological ensemble, and uh, eventually the rules enact uh, situated schools of thoughts, of course. Um, and um, yeah, so of course, the technological embedding in complex uh, infrastructures is the appanage of Homo sapiens. Um, but my motivation for investigating cosmotechnics in uh, cultivation design practices lies in the material semiotic principles defining the relationship with natural resources in our milieu. Because modern technical objects and their systems of existence tend to be functionalist, rationalist, or trend based for a major part, it considers techniques not as a mediating medium that can serve as a platform for negotiation, 
the trazer as a transhumanist in instrument. The concatenation of the two terms, interspecies cosmotechnics, suggests the technological consideration of the non-human actants as stakeholders. The perspective I adopt is to confer a strategic agency to these colleagues as a method for negotiating uh, within our human societies towards living room for other occupants of our milieu. That is by reconsidering resources, man resources management, for instance. Pre-modern designs such as uh, Shintoist artifacts and architectures are remarkably exemplifying this contrast, where they exist as an altar of Kami animism that lasts by means of rigid religious rituals. While the concept and its aesthetics may be attractive, um, let's have a look at the consequences of this mediating perspective in technological systems for sustainability. I will be using the term technical milieu in the sense of the uh, paleoanthropologist uh, André leroy Gouin, who defined it as the mediating apparatus between the um, corporeal or um, societal milieu, so the humans on the left, if you will, uh, which are called internal milieu, and the external natural milieu on the right. Um, so obviously the technical one is composed of networks of objects and actors at play. And in the modern paradigm, on-demand services involve a dramatic expansion of these networks, such as discussed in the STS since the 80s. The direct consequence is a distanciation or even a dis dissociation of the user vis-a-vis -vis resource management involved in the network, eventually fueled by a modernist cosmotechnic. The technical milieu therefore expands by means of automation, relocation, and autonomies of scale, while the internal milieu the humans basically delegates. Of course, this is a tremendously detrimental um, uh, effect to, to sustainable resources management. So how to reassociate? The geographical anchorage of technical objects has been investigated by philosopher of techniques, uh, Gilbert Simondon previously, and he proposed the notion of techno-geographic milieu to describe an object, a system that has more than one dependency to its natural milieu. Simonon uses the now infamous example of the Gimbal hydroelectric uh, turbine that is being cooled down by the water flow while it produces energy. The turbine is dependent on the retention lake to operate, of course, but it can be located in a variety of dams. The technique is fully dependent on the uh, environment, but is geographically non-specific. In the article Fragile Computation, um, Phil Ayers and I are suggesting that Simonon's interest in 1958 in the book on the mode of existence of technical objects was towards the evaluation of the industrial genius serving efficiency and were less, less interested in ecological consequences. For this reason, we suggest that it is the inverse proposition of Simondon's technogeographic milieu that can be um, of help to uh, strategically integrate resource uh, economy in the mode of existence of a design. By replacing utilization for a dependence, the geography is made a non-negotiable trait in the design. A distinct technical system that embraces this definition is obviously terroir, because it is by definition the quality of a product originating from a geographically and culturally delimited ter territory. Inter interestingly enough, this uh, definition of terroir proposed by UNESCO and the French institutes um, INRA and INAO doesn't even specify um, that it is a quality of food and beverages only, but generalizes it to um, any interaction system, as you can see here. The environment or external milieu is so specific in Tawa that the methods and materials are protected from demands of modernity with conditions of control of the finished product, of course. The fauna, flora, and microbial communities are a core part of the milieu with usage of woods in aging or naturally occurring ferments, for instance. The technogeography, so to speak, is its very existence, as large pressed cheeses are traditionally results of cooperatives that gather the milk for pre-modern supply chain management, for instance. Of course, vernacular architecture lives on a similar conditions, um, but works on a different nature and life cycle. To meet its first principle of affordability, it relies not only on the local availability of materials, but also of knowledge and know-how. And this is a critical aspect in both worlds. Cross person ships ship <laughs> is the fault key of these systems. The rituals representing, among other aspects, an orchestration of knowledge transmission. Furthermore, open blueprints and methods sharing in vernacular architecture become part of the collective identity, 
similarly to the re resulting product of terroir. We conclude in the fragile computation article that the prism of locality serves the resource um, management rights in synchronizing inhabitants and consumers' lives with that of um, natural phenomena. Introducing strategic dependencies into the design of a technical objects is then not unlike planned obsolescence with another intention at play. Of course, other on the other side of the spectrum, reducing the process of delegation goes hand in hand with what is referred to as care practices where individuals and communities are individuating by embracing a craft ranging from design to repair, and moreover, that contributes to maintaining social link. For Donna Haraway and Anatin readers, this even ties back to discourses on non-scalability. The effect of this approach supports a material semiotics that fundamentally contributes to um, alternative individual ontologies, to redefine the attachments with human and non-human actants we establish as individuals through technique. Promoting craft, effect, and non-scalability as design traits sheds light on the process of becoming of the object in its production context. That is why I suggested in the abstract of this presentation um, um, uh, some sort of turn towards ontology-focused uh, design practice, one that displaces the center of gravity of a project from the um, object or, um, in itself, its function, to its in-becoming and transformations throughout its life cycle. This ties back uh, to a topic we had the chance to discuss in late August in a small committee, and that regards the transformative potential of the craft of cultivated productions and their aesthetic. Interestingly, one of the conclusions of this research into the Kantian aesthetics of grossness a feeling defined as the combination of fascination and disgust, was its recourse in queer and feminist art from the 1920s on as a means of not only unsettling conventions of discourse and identity legitim legitimation, but also of promoting collective methods of production before the masculine idea of the isolated genius. Of course, this argument can be ported to intentions of collaborating with microbial lactants, in a post-humanist perspective, but it links more directly to what I was showing minutes ago on communities building through um, shared craftspersonship and ritualization. Cultivated productions such as in kombucha pellicles or mycelium-based composites bear the potential of tying the two ends. On the one hand, it can um, contribute to closing the disastrous gap between users and the resource management, and on the other, it can promote an aesthetic that nudges our uh, perception of the productions toward craft and the ontology of the work. The research on aesthetics in, uh, uh, is synthesized in an article called Designing the Growth, written with a um, historian of architecture, Nadja Godilia Chami. Now the focus on craft and effect, such as promoted in new materialist writings regarding living companionships, meets practices of complex systems modeling and suggests limits of human ways of knowing. Based on a literature review and pre-screening experimental series, I designed a fungal growth simulation model based on moisture dynamics. The simulated phenomena are evaporation and capillarity. And the model takes the form of a rhino grasshopper plugin called Prototaxitis deradiatory. Um, the interest of the grasshopper node coding environment, as you may know, is of course the affordability that it allows for the users. And uh, especially in our context, it makes a great platform for computational design education. The simulation model is stochastic. Uh, <laughs> so it ties back to the, what we were chatting a, a few weeks ago, um, Dylan. And, um, so basically, it means that each data point is being assigned a confidence level at the setup. And while the moisture dynamics and fungal colonization are being solved, a confidence level in their presence is computed in parallel. In this visualization, you can see um, that larger volumes represent higher probabilities of fungal growth. And as you can witness in this particular example here, um, a lower in, um, level of confidence in the initial data sets are uh, influencing dramatically the result uh, in the stochastic map because, of course, it's iterative. And, um, but of course, this depends on the model setup. Another interest in the grasshopper environment is the diversity of plugins that it comprises, of which environmental analysis. Because CETA focuses on material studies at multiple scales, 
we have integrated radiation analysis at the structure level with this uh, piece laboratory simulation. The radiation analysis is not thermal and is based on the uh, boundary mesh of the work. The, um, so basically, we are, what we what we did was to um, have a custom code that was developed uh, to interpolate radiation data into a stochastic volumetric warmth map, which can be calibrated to specific thermal conductivity of a mycelium-based composite. With this particular architectural techniques that we saw, um, we can basically isolate nodes and iteratively uh, simulate the um, moisture dynamics in the structure for predicting fungal colonization. The work is still in development, um, especially because it does not incorporate rainwater nor variations in uh, relative humidity yet, and requires a calibration work um, at the one-to-one -one scale in outdoors condition, which we know can be quite time expensive. That being said, uh, we have been using this simulation model to teach architecture students about mycelium-based composites craft, and through a very iterative process between experiments and simulation, they went on to calibrate the model with regards to moisture dynamics observed in control environments and fungal colonization speed and patterns. Further, from a control or um, prediction tool, the simulation model has also been used to probe the design space that such moisture focus allows. In this example, we can see that the students rapidly went on to uh, design complex um, scaffolds that suggest a gradient colonization rather than um, an homogeneous one. And a variety of cultivation strategies have been explored with a specific focus on, its, um, on this in, um, environmental conditions integration in the design. Interestingly enough, this rather technological process nudges users towards not only integrating performative, fully homogeneous materials made of mycelium, but towards articulating their designs around fungal colonization understanding, thus conveying a um, consideration for the aliveness of fungi and support the design of one-to-one -one, um, on-site cultivation protocols. This particular workshop will be the topic of a paper that is in writing and will be published in the coming months if you're interested. Um, yeah, so the vernacular potential of mycelium-based composites reflects a breadth of um, creative craft and advanced engineering when combining a fine understanding of colonization dynamics with the variety of substrate compositions. The emerging cosmotechnics from CETA's works revolves around craft before engineering as a means to promote non scalability, uh, but valorize the depth of knowledge in interspecies awareness through synesthesia, combination of senses. Stochastic simulation results support this positioning and challenge our modernist and functional um, expectation in design. So basically our future works will uh, try and look into integrating further context uh, data to refine vernacular constructive methodologies with two objectives, promoting locality as the most significant lever for sustainable architectural design. And in the context of the fungal architectures research project, um, continue to develop design rules for long-term hosting living fungi. Thank you.